Okay, so welcome to this first video on the, the stern Gerlach experiment. So, um, why do we talk about the stern Gerlach experiment? It's mainly because this was, or this is still one of the most um, clear demonstrations of uh, an effect that can only be explained with quantum mechanics, that can be explained with classical mechanics. So we have to go back to the 1920s, 1921 and 1922. So it started with an experiment that um, Otto Stern um, started in 1921 and then Walter Gerlach joined in 1922. And what they did is they used um, a beam of silver atoms. So they heated up silver atoms in an oven uh, just by heating up silver. Um, and then through a set of collimator, they created um, a collimated beam of silver atoms. Now, why would you want to create a, a beam of silver atoms and why is this useful for quantum mechanics? Mainly it relates to the fact that uh, silver has a single electron in the outer shell that defines the spin and therefore the magnetic moment of the silver atoms. So if you are working, if you're doing experiments with a beam of silver atoms, you're really doing experiments with a beam where the spin is determined by that single electron. And of course, um, since you've already uh, uh, taken some quantum mechanics and, and you've taken modern physics, you know that this will mean that the quantization of the spin will determine quantization of these uh, silver atoms or the magnetic moment in those silver atoms. So if you look at the electron distribution of silver atoms, you have the, the, the first, second, third, fourth levels, and then the five, um, the fifth level, the five S1 um, configuration uh, gives you this, these, these electrons, um, that single electron in the outer shell. So if we look at the magnetic moment in a bit more detail, we know that classically a magnetic moment mu, a vector magnetic moment mu dotted with the magnetic field B gives you the potential energy. And this potential energy will of course vary depending on the orientation um, of the magnetic moment with respect, with respect to the B field. Um, and it will, will also depend on the position in a varying B field. So if you have a constant magnetic moment, a constant orientation with respect to the B field, but you have a changing, a changing B field, in other words, you have a gradient in this magnetic field, then that will cause a gradient in the potential energy and a gradient in the potential energy corresponds to a force. So the force is negative of the gradient of the, of the energy, or if we look at that as the gradient of mu dot B, um, for a field that is only in the z direction, then this becomes the product of the, the z component of the magnetic moment with that gradient in the z direction. And that force will be in the z direction itself. So if we have a magnetic field that is that has a gradient in the z direction, a field that itself points in the z direction, then there will be a, a, a force created that is proportional to the magnetic the magnetic moment component in the z direction. Classically, in um, the experiments that uh, uh, that, that Stern and Gerlach um, performed with this uh, this thermally distributed set of, of silver atoms, the magnetic moment is is oriented randomly, so it can be in any direction, and that means that of course this force F, which is in the z direction, will vary continuously between two extrema, where the extrema are given by uh, the magnetic field or the magnetic uh, moment being oriented in the two uh, directions, positive z direction and negative z direction. But between those two values, the force will vary continuously. And so if you set up an experiment with this silver atoms from the oven and the collimated beam that is created going through a magnetic field gradient here, um, shown by these, uh, these asymmetric um, pole tips on a magnetic field, then you expect classically to see the, um, the silver atoms where the magnetic moment is pointing along the z direction to be um, to be bent in one direction and the magnetic moment in the opposite direction will be bent in the other direction but all intermediate states are possible as well and so if we uh, um, as in in the stern gerlach experiment in the first version of that experiment if you look at how these silver atoms then arrive at a detector uh, you'll see these uh, silver atoms distributed um, continuously between these two extrema, these two critical values. So that's the classically expected distribution of silver atoms, okay? Now, what was actually observed is that we don't get 
uh, this continuous distribution, but instead we see two peaks appear. So there's one peak where um, the, the detected silver atoms all end up on this positive critical value and another peak where all of the uh, silver atoms end up in this negative critical value. So that indicates that the mag magnetic moment can be only one of these two values. There's no intermediate value. So either the magnetic moment is pointing in this direction, uh, in one direction, along the z direction, or the magnetic moment is pointing in the opposite direction. And now, of course, that's something that we, we explain by saying that the spin, which, remember, determines the magnetic moment of the silver atom, the spin is quantized between plus h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2. So there's no intermediate values allowed, only those two components the, of the projection of the spin on the z direction are allowed. Okay, So this magnetic moment is uh, determined by the uh, outer shell electron and it's given by the spin plus or minus uh, h bar over 2. And so that basically was proof that there's quantization of, uh, of the electron spin. Similarly, of course, we can do these experiments um, in, uh, in the x and the y direction. And so if we have a magnetic field that's in the x direction, we have a gradient um, in that magnetic field in the x direction, then we'll split up the set of, uh, of, of silver atoms in, um, in two beams, one beam that will be uh, a set of silver atoms that has the, the, the positive h bar over two spin component in the x direction, and another beam that has negative h bar over 2 as the component of, of the spin in the x direction. And similarly, of course, for y. And then, of course, once we have this kind of uh, spin separator, if we um, separate the spins based on these, uh, the interaction in, the, in this gradient magnetic field, then we can put multiple of these spin rotators, or spin separators, sorry, after each other. So um, that's shown here. We have one we have a first separation step where we separate based on a, a field in the z direction and a gradient in the z direction. So we split based on the spin component in the z direction. Spin plus h bar over 2 uh, in the z direction goes to this direction. And we discard the spin uh, component in the z direction minus h bar over 2 um, atoms. Uh, and we can continue working with another, for example, um, gradient in the z direction. We know that, of course, the, the spin component in the z direction is h bar over is plus h bar over two. So that's the only thing. That's the only uh, beam that we will be able to to split off in this uh, in this second step. We've already basically removed all of the the spin component in the z direction minus h bar over two atoms. So we're left with just um, the spin component in the z direction plus h bar over two. So this is if we have two stages, the first one in with a B field in the Z direction and the second one also with a B field and gradient in the Z direction. Now what happens if we take um, a first separation step with a B field in the Z direction and a second stage that is not in the Z direction? So that's shown here. Um, so we start with a, uh, a field and a gradient in the Z direction and then an, a field and a gradient in the x direction. So again, we separate based on the spin component in the z direction um, in this first stage. And in the second stage, we separate based on the spin component in the x direction. So we end up with, um, classically, you would think, in, uh, in the end, these two beams that have a spin component in the z direction, that's plus h bar over 2, and then a spin component in the x direction, that's either plus or minus h bar over 2, depending on which of those two beams um, you look at. Um, and of course, the reason why S, um, the spin component in the x direction is still possible in both of those states is because classically a measurement of this, uh, uh, of the z component of the spin does not affect at all what uh, the x component of the spin does. Now, this is a two-stage experiment. So remember, we started with a first with a single stage with only a, a, B, comp a B field in the z direction and a gradient in the z direction. Then we added um, a, a second stage. So now what happens if we add a third stage? And we'll add this third stage in such a way that we first have a, a B field in the z direction. So we'll, se we'll separate the, the um, silver atoms based on the z component of their spin. Then we have a separator based 
on the x direction so we'll separate based on the spin component in the x direction and then we'll go back to um, a separation stage based on the z direction okay so what do we get then it turns out when you do the experiment so classically you expect that um, once you've selected in the first stage your uh, sz equals to plus h bar over two atoms in the second stage you select sx equals to plus h bar over two if you do another separation based on uh, um, a gradient in the z direction you expect that in the end you only end up with um, sc equals to plus h bar over two because that's what you selected in the first stage now it turns out when you do it do the experiment in the end you do end up again with two equal intensity beams so what happens is that the measurement or the selection of of atoms with spin in the x direction of plus h bar over 2 that destroys any knowledge um, of the z component of the of the spin so in the first stage by selecting one of the beams we get knowledge of the spin component in the z direction the measurement of of the spin component in the x direction destroys that knowledge and so in the end when we do another measurement of the spin component in the z direction we end, end up with both of the components still um, still possible so this is of course something that classically is completely impossible but um, quantum mechanically this is allowed and this really indicates that quantum mechanics does behave quite fundamentally different um, than, uh, than classical mechanics. We cannot simultaneously have knowledge of the z component of the spin and the x component of the spin and this is it's important to point out that this is not an experimental shortcoming this is not something that we could change by by doing a different experiment this is fundamentally um, a restriction of the physics um, that describes spin or that describes um, the quantum mechanics of, of this process so um, in the next lecture we'll we'll look at um, a, a, a similar scenario um, in a different context so again a process where a measurement of one quantity is incompatible with a measurement of a similar quantity in another direction and in particular we'll look at we'll look at that in the context of uh, polarization of light so stay tuned for that <laughs>